Namaste. Greetings. Welcome, my friends. Executive coach and author Stephen Josephs has worked with many top business leaders, and he guides them in transcending the egoic conditioning that actually limits their impact on other people and also their capacity to impact social change. And so in this conversation, we look at what he's learned about inner freedom and awakening and being in the role, whatever role we're in, at work, at home, in a way that is expressing our inner freedom. And we he speaks about his own inner trauma and what, you know, how the different practices have helped him with trauma. He draws on 60 years, 60 years of spiritual practice. He draws on models of adult development that show that there's the egoic levels and then there's what's beyond the ego. And he draws on the poetry of Lao Tzu. A personal disclosure, Stephen is a best friend of over 50 years. And he was my first real inspiration in terms of meditation. He really helped to evoke in me a love of meditation. I hope you'll enjoy. Welcome, Stephen. Thank you for doing this with me. Uh, this is a delight. So I wanted to jump right in. I have the, the first kind of main thing I wanted to ask you about, you meditate more than anyone I know, for, for the most part. I mean, you have done hours and hours of practice a day for uh, something like 60 years. And and for those listening, uh, Stephen and I met about 50 years ago. So, you know, he's one of my oldest, bestest friends. And speaking to you, Stephen, you are pretty much my first inspiration about meditating. And you guided me, you were a teacher, still are. So, and I think what I came away with and what you transmitted was a love of practicing. So I wanted to just start with, you know, what got you going and so dedicated to practice? What does it do for you? Well, it started in desperation. So I had... Uh... I got off to a rough start in life and there was some trauma involved. And I, I wanted to bring that into the conversation because I think a lot of people experience that. And uh, maybe my journey will be instructive to them. So um, when I was about three months old, uh, my mother was very nervous that I was going to die because she had a, a boy who did die of sudden of SIDS, you know, at three months. So she was um, very concerned about me. And my father, watching her be so nervous, um, said, let's go on a vacation and we'll just, we'll leave him with a nurse. It was a good idea. It turned out the nurse was uh, rough. And I started refusing food. Mm. And uh, when my parents came back, uh, I was being fed intravenously. So that was that's tough at the beginning because there's no self in other, there's no sense of of uh, anything. and um, it's it's hard to get your nervous system set that way early on. And I didn't really know how upsetting it was until I was in my twenties, and I was um, I was deliriously in love with this young woman and I used to ask her to marry me all the time. And finally, she said yes. And we woke up the next morning after that and I looked at her and a voice in my head said, get the F away from me. I wouldn't want her to touch me or look at me. And this voice in my head was so loud and uh, vicious. I didn't know what to do. I couldn't I wasn't mature enough to talk to her about it. And I went to psychologists who couldn't help. And uh, our relationship imploded. And I was just convinced that I would never be able to find love 
uh, with anyone, that I was incapable of it and deeply flawed. So I ended up going to a tantric yoga retreat where uh, Yogi Bhajan was claiming that, you know, he was this Mahan tantric and he set us up in lines of men and women facing each other, chanting mantras and holding difficult positions for hours, you know, and I find that I find that liberating. That was the only way I could connect uh, with a woman uh, without being terrified. And uh, so I thought, wow, this could be good. And that started me off in uh, 3HO. And I spent 10 years there. Um, when I, uh, I, I had also studied NLP and uh, neuro-linguistic programming and hypnosis. And I began to understand through hypnosis the messages that we were getting from Yogi Bhajan. They seemed to be quite poisonous. And so uh, my wife and I, who had had an arranged marriage, and that was the, uh, my other key to success, uh, was that I could get some si uh, simulation of intimacy through this arranged marriage. And, you know, I thought it would all work. Um, but after 10 years, we left. And uh, at that point, I was still feeling the results of that early trauma. And, you know, what I, I think of meditation sometimes uh, metaphorically as, you know, if you imagine we're standing outside a dark room and we'd like to see what's inside that room, but uh, we'd really like a clear light that we could shine everywhere, but we don't have a clear light. What we have is a slide projector with all the slides of our uh, beliefs, our traumatic experiences and whatever. And that's how we're searching around the room. And so the question is, how do we drop the slides was kind of my question. And um, so it, it started out that way, but all the way through, um, I think that practicing, uh, in the beginning, it soothed me. And I thought that was important. And it's, it's only later in the process that I uh, found more uh, profound benefit from meditation, but that's how it started. Well, it, it makes sense when you speak. I mean, that's one of the things that meditation can do. If you learn to just focus your attention and keep it really steady, it can calm and soothe your nervous system. And I love your metaphor. I just think it's it's so cool just to sense that we're habitually looking at the same slides over and over again, the same beliefs about what's wrong with us or how we're separate from others or what we can't trust. And so as you describe it, as you matured, you started to be able to shine a light so you could see when those slides are showing and be able to let go of them and actually see what's make your way around the room. And I want to come back to the different ways you use meditation, because um, I feel like you have explored a real weave that has, I would say, healed in a very deep way, the trauma you just described. So I want to kind of come back to some of the practices. But in addition to meditating for you know six decades you've also been doing executive coaching for 40 years for a long time and you've been drawing on spiritual practices so so many of us um want our work life to weave with you know our spiritual lives and you've done that you've you've wedded the two and could you just speak a little on how on what you do as a coach and how you integrate uh, some of these meditation practices? Well, for the first uh, 20 years, I used meditation sometimes with my executive clients, but I didn't really realize the value of it until um, I went into partnership with a very brilliant man, uh, Bill Joyner, and he introduced me to the idea of uh, psychological stages of adult development. And 
it understanding those stages really explained a lot to me. Um, so there are stages of adult development, just like there are stages of development with kids. You know, so a five-year-old cognitively and emotionally is different than than a ten-year-old, and different than a twelve-year-old or an eighteen-year-old, and it just. But uh, with adult development, it doesn't automatically come as easily with age anymore, and people can reach a plateau. And so, in our work, uh, we wrote a book called Leadership Agility, and in our work, um, we described two stages uh, that are very common among uh, leaders or executives in corporations uh, today. So one is the expert stage and the other is the achiever stage. And the expert is, is really, the, their sense of self is demonstrating that they're experts, that they know stuff, that they have the answer. And the achiever is is in the same way ego involved that there's a sense of of self that depends on recognition that they led the charge and you know those stages are really uh, useful in one way they help us develop our skills and and capacities so if I were going to get uh, operated on my by a cardiologist I'd want her to have gone through this stage in her life where she was trying to be the best heart surgeon in the entire world. And that's uh, how she got her chops to make the pun. But, um, but there are stages beyond that. The trouble with those egoic stages is they don't recognize other people in the in the in a way that they could. And, and because of that, they don't use the collective intelligence of teams and groups and their organization. They can't really reverse roles with someone else and have that be meaningful. And it's difficult for them to, their timeline is shorter and they don't see the ripple effects of their actions. Uh, um, but it doesn't mean that you need to progress beyond those stages uh, to be a successful leader financially. There are plenty of people like Elon Musk and uh, uh, Steve Jobs, for instance, who were just driven and drove other people really hard. Um, and their financial success is inarguable. Uh, on the other hand, I, I don't think I'd like to spend much time in Elon Musk's head <laughs> from what I hear about him. Yeah. So there, those stages, are we call them heroic stages where you're the hero in your own drama, but post-heroic stages are really uh, where all the, the wealth lies. So tell us more about that because you did a very cool kind of project where you interviewed leaders and yeah. found out about what was beyond those ego stages. So yeah, so please share. Yeah, so... Um, when we were looking for people to interview, I would ask people that I knew to recommend people. And uh, I had three questions I would ask, you know, I'd, is there someone you know that we could interview uh, whose leadership has made a difference and you admire them personally, and they've been in the game long enough to get over themselves? And I would watch their faces fall <laughs> with that last criterion. Um, because it's rare, you yeah. know, about 10% of, of leaders are at that stage. There's, there's one I interviewed, uh, I think I've told you about this one before. Uh, this man was an angel investor. So he had a sort of a portfolio of beginning companies and he would advise, you know, executives from those companies or entrepreneurs. And he described how he listened so he would listen to their problem and then he would come up with an idea and then drop it and continue to listen. And then they'd come up, they'd keep talking and he'd come up with another idea and then uh, he would drop that. And then finally, he would wait until he described it as, as though he was filled from light from above. 
And only then would he engage with the other person. I love it. I love it. I mean, how many of us are already planning what we're going to say? Already yeah. planning, barely taking in a thing that's going on. And there is something about being listened to, being heard, being seen. Um, I think of the great, you know, the leaders that are not caught in the, um, you know, heroic levels that are beyond that is that anybody that's with them is going to leave feeling better about themselves. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. I mean, yeah, that's like a, that's cool. like a huge deal. It um, is. It is. And those people are, are such a pleasure to work for and with. And uh, the, the thing that can trap people is sometimes they get too wealthy or too um, uh, famous, something in an accent's an insulation for them. And they can't get good feedback anymore because people are aware of the power of that person and it distorts their world. And that that's really tough. And I, I don't know if I want to tell this story, but I had a um, an experience with that early on in my career where I had that kind of celebrity dangled in front of me. And I, I just said, you know, I'm back to my uh, trauma story. I, I thought, I, I'm not going to do it. Uh, people offered five movies for me to be, um, I'd be the star of the movie. It was going to be a vehicle for my stardom. And uh, it was about a young classical guitarist who uh, goes to Europe and loses himself in the rock and roll scene. And I'm, I'm sitting at Sardi's and they're saying, yeah, this is it. You know, like you're going to be a star. And I said, uh, no, <laughs> I don't want to do it. I can't believe you did that, Stephen. And I know you. I could have yeah. been <laughs> I could have been so close to it all. <laughs> yeah. Well, I was I was sitting there and I was thinking, you know, I'm 20 something years old. I forget what it was. And I said, I don't know who I am. And mm -hmm. if I do this, I'm never going to know who mm -hmm. I am. Mm -hmm. And and I thought also, you know, I should forget the movie and go straight to rehab. Because <laughs> <laughs> that's where I would end up. Why you know? waste time? We know we're going to be there. In <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's hilarious. But, you know, it makes so much sense because what you're what I'm hearing you say is that we get so caught in our own narrative about being special or being the achiever or knowing the most. And when the world is reflecting that back, yes, indeed, you are special, um, it becomes a jail and it separates us. And yeah. the only way you can be in your the post heroic, you know, be you know, not as caught in the ego is if we're really truly beyond the narratives which is the same i mean as i listen yeah. to you, it's it's exactly the same as the unfolding on any spiritual path it's just to free ourselves from the stories the stories that are grand and the stories that are you know the inflation and the deflation both right so it's reminding me of uh, lao tzu who's one of my favorite uh, poets and uh, philosophers. So he has this one that goes, which means more to you, you or your renown? Which brings more to you, you or what you own? And which would cost you more if it were gone? And, and uh, he also has uh, another one. Um, well, wait, with that one, just... Yeah. It's so, uh, you know, the Buddhists talk about praise and blame, which means more to you, you or your renown. And, and I'm just slowing down on that because um, we're such social creatures that our worth or our renown, I mean, it's very deep in our conditioning to go for that, to go for impressing. Like when I... I often will invite a reflection of somebody that you've been with recently that you really respect and how much of what you were doing was in some way to get a certain kind of response from them. 
of, you know, approval or respect or admiration, it's very hard to put that down, to not, to not in some, I mean, that what Lao Tzu is suggesting is a really big deal, to not care about our reputation. And um, I'm bringing that up because I had an experience some years back where it was right in my face, where I was... Um, I was doing a keynote at a conference and going to be on a panel, and I felt imposter syndrome like really coming up strong because it was on actually some of what we're talking about, about trauma and clinical applications of meditation and so on. And I had friends that were on the panel that were so much more the expert. So my fear about not being the expert really hooked me on that, you know, what matters more, me or my renown? Well, I really wanted my reputation to look good. <laughs> and I knew that going in, Stephen. So what I did was um, I kept asking what most matters, what most matters, what most matters. And I got to the place where what most mattered is that in some way I'd be helpful and that I wanted to have with each person I contacted, I wanted them to feel that I cared about them. And, and I had to keep on going back to that again and again, all that matters, may this be helpful, and may others feel my care. And um, it was so interesting. So I'm pausing here because in working with leaders, I would imagine that people's reputation, how the others look at them would be a very big deal in what you'd be helping them to kind of relax the grip around in order to get to who they really are. Yeah. Yeah. I, um, so I started thinking about Leonard Bernstein because uh, I had this interaction with him where for some reason I was in Key West and I drove him two mile, uh, two hours to see swim with dolphins. And it was really great because he jumped in the water. He was just like a 10 year old kid with these dolphins. And then I had him for two hours. I'm just trying to imagine Leonard, because I mean, all I can imagine is in these, you know, in the tuxedos and in front of groups, you know, <laughs> so swimming with <laughs> dolphins is a great image. I yeah, love no, it. And, uh, he just loved it. So I asked him, I got to ask him anything I wanted to about music. So I asked him, well, so if you're a guest conductor and you're conducting a, uh, a symphony that you've conducted many, many times, what, uh, how do you prepare for it? And he said, well, I get in a room with a piano where no one can hear me, where I can howl and yell and I put the score on the piano and I play all the parts and I I move around and I I just, I sing every part and, until what comes to me is the composer's intent. Mm. And mm. once I have the composer's intent, everything falls into place after that. I don't have to prepare beyond that. Mm. And so, uh, and I was reminded that, that by you are connecting with your intent. And uh, it's such a beautiful thing to do that I, I do it sometimes where I'll, I'll think of, the opening for a presentation, I used to do presentations. I don't do them so much anymore. But I would memorize the beginning of it and say it again and again, just like um, Leonard did with the opening of a symphony. And I would check in my own self, where was I incongruent with this message? You know, where did I not quite believe myself, or maybe the message needed to be adjusted so that it was more in line to what I, I really thought. And I would use these uh, methods of kind of finding the little part of myself that was reacting and, and uh, dissolve it mm. so that uh, I, I became totally congruent with the message by the end. And uh, mm really helpful to do. I would do that with my clients too. So you're beginning, to, I, I was going to ask you to talk a little more about how you bring 
meditation in you know with problems that people have at work and you're describing one which is just get in touch with what your intention is because mm -hmm. if you're aligned with your intention you know it's like one zen master said the most important thing is remembering the most important thing <laughs> you know it's like if we're aligned you know the the intelligence of the universe flows through us. So one is to get people aligned. But as you mentioned, there's objections like, yeah, but I want to look good or yeah, but I want more money or yeah, but I want that other person to um, cooperate with me. And so how do, you, how do you bring meditative, contemplative practices? Can you start sharing some of that? Yeah. So when I was, uh, my 10 years uh, in the ashram, um, I really tried to get to some place spiritually. I was like the poster child for spiritual materialism. And uh, I really, you know, tried to do it that way. Um, what I, what I learned with later practices, Taoist practices, is that you could dissolve, um, things that, that got in the way. Uh, I wanted to tell you about how I work with someone in preparation for, say, a difficult conversation or a negotiation. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, you know, what you're asking pertains to that. So what I would do with them is I, they would describe that they're going to talk to someone. So if you and I were doing it, say, we'll invent this person you're going to talk to named Bob, you know, and then I would ask you, so what are you going to say to Bob? And you would tell me, you know, how you plan to frame the conversation and open the conversation. And then I would uh, write all that down dutifully. And then I would say, okay, so the way to prepare for this is have you become Bob as much as you can, you know, to, to speak as he does and to move in your vocal cadence and without being a caricature, be Bob. And then I, I would start to say, so Bob, um, Tell me who's at home for you. Tell me how you started your business. Tell me, you know, and then I would say, uh, you know, once they really got into uh, how Bob felt in the world, then I would say, what's at stake for you in the, your conversation with Tara? And then, uh, you know, and then that answer would come up. And then, and then finally, I would say, okay, I happen to know what uh, Tara is going to say to you do you want to hear it so deep inside this role then you know you would get back what you were intending to say and then invariably people have the response of that could work oh that would never work I mean, you know, <laughs> so, so then they they adjust it but then the next stage of it is to say is there anything about uh bob that's uh off-putting to you and then I get answers like, uh, you know, uh, he's a self-important jerk, <laughs> you know, <laughs> stuff like that. And then you would say, okay, so just imagine that you are behaving the way Bob does when he's at his worst. I know you don't. It's probably why you don't like it in him, but uh, just imagine it. And then what emotions would have to be driving that behavior in you for you to act like that. Not just the circumstances, but the actual emotions that are driving things. And then you get in touch with that. And you get in touch with that by feeling it in your body. So one way, a, a lot of people can feel something in their body, but they, they don't really understand uh, what the emotion is. They can't really pinpoint it. So when I was getting out of the ashram, I had spent 10 years bypassing every emotion I ever had so I could be devotional. And uh, I, I invented this little technique for me, which is you take the feeling, so you'd say, oh, I feel this in my solar plexus, is this kind of tightness. And then you say, well, if you if that tight energy in your solar plexus could rise to your face and animate your facial expression let that happen so the person would do that and they would go you know that's mine at the moment 
what's this? And then uh, by reading your face from the inside, you can name it. So they would... I just want to pause here because I think that's a gem. You know, this strategy to get back in touch with your feelings of being able to take something and express it in your face and then really sense more um, explicitly and directly, somatically, what is going on. I just think that's a powerful approach. So just want to bookmark that one. It helps. And also with a lot of my executive clients, they, they aren't aware of what they're feeling. And so yeah. that's a, a little, but then the next part of it is, is how do we dissolve those things? So I, I think that, uh, you know, the, I always think that, uh, you know, we can fall into a perpetual project of self-improvement and we're not necessarily so nice to ourselves when we're, when we're doing that project. Um, so one thing to do is to be able to take whatever arises and meet it kindly. And that, that's why I love the work that you do with rain and after the rain. I mean, that's, it's quite beautiful and the allowing and compassion that's there. Um, and I think ultimately the message in all of that work is whatever arises is ultimately at its core looking for this divine connection with the universe uh, in this kind of oneness. And so the idea of dropping yourself is to experience that, at least the way I understand it, over and over and over again, that even these things that you feel that are, are, are uh, uncomfortable and uh, drive difficult behaviors and things like that, at their core, uh, you can, feel them uh, sort of evolve and drop um, their protective qualities or protective mission and open up to something sublime and beautiful. And so once we do that over and over and over again, this critical mass starts to shift over to the side of, I actually have confidence that uh, uh, everything that I do is, uh, you know, how plants are heliotropic. This is more of like union tropic, that everything is going in that direction. And uh, that's, uh, that's a beautiful thing to experience. So I want my clients to experience that. I want me, I want myself to do it too. And uh, that's been important for me. Yeah, I, again, I want to kind of just slow down because what you're saying feels to me at the heart of all healing is that it's not, we don't heal regardless of the difficult stuff. It's almost by opening to those energies and trusting that in opening to them, there's there's a transfiguration that happens. It's like when I say to fear, thank you for trying to protect me. Like I get that that fear is life loving life, that there is no emotion that's not about life loving life, that that when our body starts realizing that we start trusting the weather systems that are inside and when we open to them, they actually transform to be more intensified awareness and love. They do transform in that way. And I feel like you're when you describe dissolving of meeting it compassionately, opening to it, inviting it to join, to rejoin the whole, that rejoining is a deepening of awake and loving presence. Yeah. It's, 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 it's beautiful. So I have, I have a question. I kind of want to roll back because what you just did is you kind of took us to what the possibility is, that when you can get people to um, role reverse, that that empathy, it's kind of you're activating that part of the brain that's empathetic when you can get them to to bring attention and learn how to feel things in the body, then there's actual deep awakening. 
let's go back to the conversation and with Bob, because the question I had was, so my the Bob in my life has um, in some way betrayed my trust. And I feel, you know, enraged and hurt. And you know, I feel very strong feelings. And I'm wondering if, you know, I'm going to in some way talk and try to have a clearing with Bob. Um, but if those emotions are strong, and you asked me, well, what's what's going on for Bob and be Bob, I, I would have, my emotions would block that initial step towards empathy. So yeah. I'm wondering, how do you, how do you, let's say somebody's having those feelings, what would, how would you start working with them? Uh, to sort of peel off the top layer. So I want to just, uh, uh, one of the methods that I really love is uh, Connie Ray Andreas's wholeness work. And it, it pertains to this really well. So what she would do and what I would do using this work is I would say, uh, so there's this, this idea that um, you're having these emotions and then there's sort of a reaction to having them. Like I, I, you know, whatever that is, I don't want to have them. I don't want these to get in the way. I don't want. So that's where you start working. You In her work, you would say, where is the one who doesn't like to have these emotions? So let's, yeah. let's slow it down and stay with this example. Okay. And first of all, to the Bobs of this world, forgive me, it's not you. <laughs> <laughs> I just don't want any misunderstandings here. Right. So, <clears throat> there, and the reason I'm bringing this up is because I think the most crippling suffering in the world is coming from polarization, mistrust, betray, you know, the whole thing. So, mm -hmm. I come to you and I say, you know, somebody in our firm has behaved in a way that I feel like completely, it, it violates me, it harms me. I feel like they've betrayed me. I'm having all these feelings. And I'm really angry. They did wrong. They are bad. I'm not as much in those moments thinking, oh, and I shouldn't feel that. That may be, that is often a part of the mix. I mean, you know, judging what's going on. But I am in in that sense of feeling angry and betrayed. Yeah. Well, then, then uh, so rather than going to the place that I suggested, I think what you would do is just uh, uh, work with the physical sensation, never never mind what it's about. Right. Go for the constellation of sensations in yeah. your body, yeah. and then start to um, start to dissolve them. And so, um, you know, I, I studied um, one of the things that I've studied for the past thirty years and continue to study is with a teacher named Bruce. Francis, who, who is a Taoist teacher, and he teaches Taoist martial arts and meditation and stuff like that. And uh, he would, um, his method of dissolving is to start above your head and start to just dissolve bit by bit in your body uh, all the way down. Connie Ray is, is more specific. So she has something. So, so for instance, if if you contact that feeling now, where in your body does it live? Well, usually when it's anger and feeling, because I'm not, I'm feeling a lot of love and loving being with you, so I'm not immediately here with it. But um, yeah. it's it's a kind of a clench and a heat and a pressure in my chest and my belly. Yeah. So the way you would work with it, and just I'll just walk you through it, and you may not dive into it, but um, just for reference for people who are watching. So you have this this feeling here, this clutching here, and then uh, you really feel it as a constellation of sensations and the heat that's there. And then you say, well, where is the one who feels like this? So where that comes from from her is the idea that uh, teachers like Ramana Maharshi and people would say, no I, no problem, you know, get rid of the, the I. Yeah. So she, she had a way to operationalize that getting rid of the I. So so when you say, where is the one who, who feels like this? Mm -hmm. Then 
often when people get the knack of that, they say, oh, actually, it's right here. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's just above my head. And and uh, really, what's the size and shape of that thing, that energy? Oh, you know, it's this, it's round, it's, uh, it's a little heavy, and it's bluish, <laughs> you know, <laughs> whatever they say. And then you, you, then that, that's there. And then you could say, well, you could say, I experienced this. Uh, where is the I that experiences that? And then you get these layers of them. The more you practice, the fewer layers there are. But but eventually, it's like saying to yourself while you're meditating, you know, you're aware of your breath. And then you say to yourself, where is the one that's aware of her breath? And then you say, oh, it's right here. And then you say, what would happen? Uh, would it be? And then you explore that a little bit. And you say, um, would it welcome the invitation? to dissolve, melt, and relax into and as the field of awareness that's all around and throughout. And then if it says yes, then you just do that and dissolve. And then you would go to the next place over here. That was the eye that felt this in here. And you add the same invitation. You just ask, would you welcome the invitation to dissolve, melt, and relax? And that lets go. And then all of a sudden, this in your chest uh, is usually very available to dissolving. Maybe there's some little part left, and that's another facet of it. But what's interesting about this is it releases you from the burden of having to revisit your story over and over again, you know, because that's the thing that keeps it in place. But you know, in narrative therapy, there's this one. Uh, question I really love, which is after the person really gets into the narration of what their uh, whole life is about, you just say, uh, in what way is your story lying to you? Mm. Mm. You know, because it's never the whole deal. And if you believe that story 100%, <laughs> you're never going to go anywhere. So so you just, you know, in, in uh, Bruce Francis's work, he talks about these eight bodies so there's a physical body, an emotional body, uh, an energy body, a mental body, a psychic body, a, a karmic body or causal body, and a, a bo body of I individual body, and then the Tao. And things can reside at any of those frequencies. So when we're talking about our original thing about, you know, what do you do with the slides in your projector when you're trying to see the room? Um, they can, a big part of my practice has been uh, physical. So mm -hmm. I'll do Tai Chi and Bagua, which is even stronger. Uh, and what Bruce has taught me is that you let that stuff rattle your cage from the inside until, uh, because all that energy sp spiraling through your system wakes it up and it wakes it up to things that have been uh, neglected and buried. And then you go and dissolve. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a pretty whole body experience of that dissolving. You know, you're, because you've, um, you have really mastered integrating different systems and I'm, I'm, I'm just hearing it. And for those that are listening, um, there's the, always the inquiry of, well, how do you know when to do which? And so, like for me, if I go back to the, um, what I keep thinking, what about Bob, you know, that movie. But if I go back to that, there will be times that just opening into that energy, as Bruce teaches you, just feeling the energy and letting it be all that it is, what happens is that you sense that, you know, once you really give it space and more space and more space, it morphs. And anger often will morph into, uh, you know, a real sense of grieving, like there's something that was taken yes. from you. And then if you keep opening to the grieving, you'll find that embedded in that is a sense of that there's something about life you're caring about. And I find for myself that if I can keep opening to anger and not get caught in the narrative, because I, I really hear you, 
but open to the energy of it, that anger always is because there's something we care about. And if I can get to that place, it's what you were talking about before, Stephen, that there's, whether we want to call it a positive intent or life-loving life, it's the energy behind the anger is trying to wake this body-mind up to a larger belonging. That's, it always comes down to that. So, so, so sometimes there's tracking back, just the way I describe. Sometimes there's more directly what you were talking about, where you invite the anger to the energy to dissolve into a larger belonging. And when that happens, you sense that it already was a part of it, that, was, that, that there's nothing, no energy in us that isn't, it's like waves in the ocean that doesn't belong. And that starts having you trust what's going on in your body. So I'm just aware as you're talking that these are just, they're different gateways to really trusting the energies that are coming up in us. And sometimes we do need the stories because they become, if we use them wisely, they do become a portal to help us feel more fully the energies in our body. So if I like go through my mind of all the ways mm -hmm. that Bob has mistreated me, and then I start getting stirred up, and then I say, okay, thank you, story, and I come into my body, that's actually very skillful. But the problem is people don't leave the narrative. As you say, they keep looking at the slides versus shining a light on the room. Yeah, yeah, beautifully said. You know, I think also the story is useful early on because if people grow up uh, in abusive families, they swallow a story that's the story of that family and they, they don't even understand how bad it is. You know, so so they need to get into the story just, uh, uh, you know, Gabor Mate uh, spends a lot of time there, you know, just trying to get people to understand what happened to them. So if you have the story, there's some explanation for it and the, uh, uh, of how you're feeling now. So it took me a long time to get to that story of, why I had that voice in my head that was uh, so horrible. Mm. And uh, I I got that through psychodrama mm. You know, mm. stories and uh, acted them out. And also in psych psychodrama, they they often use that principle of make it bigger, make it bigger, yeah. bigger, yeah. bigger, bigger, yeah. you know. Yeah. And it does do what you described. It's the opposite of resisting. And it's, whatever we resist gets locked in, what we stop resisting and we invite actually starts moving. Movement's the deal. You want things to move. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I think that uh, um, staying with the story, uh, it, it's almost, it's a kind of alchemy. There's energy locked up in it. Yes. And if we can learn how to liberate it, uh, you know, that's a wonderful path. So I feel like what we're doing, and I and I really, I heard something that you said that really helps, is to sense it a bit developmentally, that there's a certain amount of time we all need to spend in being able to um, sense where, what the story wants us to pay attention to, and to go into our body to feel the layers that, you know, under the anger is the grief and, and to start getting familiar with the unlayering, the undoing, the unknotting of those kind of clenches in our body. But then you also spoke to something that wakes us up in a whole different way, which is starting to turn the attention from the particulars of the story and the energy to who's experiencing this to the kind of ghost self in the background that's bearing witness. It's like Sri Narsargadatta talks about, you know, if you watch your mind, you'll notice that there is a witness there. And if you become aware of the witness, you'll discover a light that is your own true nature and frees you. So we keep stepping back to sense 
that there's nothing solid. The, the story that was telling us who we were was just a story and that there's this beingness, this vastness, this field of infinite field that is beyond words and more the truth than any story. <laughs> So I love how you were describing uh, what you've gotten from Connie Ray, Andreas, and I will post, I will write a note on to that book, how you do that stepping back to sense what's beyond the narrative of a small self. And I wonder if this might be a good time, Stephen, for you to just guide us a little more directly so that people who are listening can get a taste of that further evolving of practice where we can kind of, uh, some, it's called the non-dual, where we're getting over ourselves in a really liberating way. Sure. So, um, yeah, let's do that. So let's just kind of uh, settle in, however you settle in. Uh, if you're driving a car, keep your eyes open. <laughs> Please, please. <laughs> and, uh, you know, just align your body. Good way to do that is to let the space in the base of your skull just gently expand and float up a little bit so that your head is nicely centered over your neck and the weight of it goes through your neck and your chest. Uh, falls a little bit, softens, so that the weight goes through your chest, through your diaphragm to your belly. And then bring your awareness uh, to your belly and simply breathe. And give a quality to the breath where the quality of the breath is just this beautiful uh, sort of dissolving energy. It's easy to relax as you exhale, you let everything go and just fall into alignment. And on the inhale, as your belly expands, just feel any tension or constriction in your belly, just give way to the breath. Just dissolve in response to the breath. And then also breathe into your lower back. The torso is like a cylinder that breathes in all directions. So breathing into the belly and the back opposite the belly, and even the sides. And on the inhale, yield to the breath. So that with each successive inhale, there's a little bit more room for the breath in your torso. And then bring your awareness so that it also includes the your belly and the level at your diaphragm. Same thing now, breathing into the belly and the diaphragm, front, back, sides. And rather than trying to push anything out, you relax and let it expand as it wants to. And only as far as it wants to. And then breathing further up, to the chest, the heart center. Breathing between your shoulder blades. So now the breath can incorporate the belly, the diaphragm, and the heart center. You can even imagine if you want a pearl of light going from your belly up through a central channel from your perineum to the top of the head. So it rises on the inhale and settles back down in your belly on the exhale. 
And then further up to your collarbone, inhaling, inhaling into your shoulders and armpits. Yielding to the breath on the inhale. Let any constriction just offer itself up and yield to this healing chi that rides on the breath. And then finally, all the way up to the top of the head. Slow the breath down. Soften it. Lao Tzu says, the universe, like a bellows, is always emptying, always full. The more it yields, the more it holds. So now letting your awareness expand through your torso and head so that it's out to your skin. bringing your awareness to your eyes. Let the breath dissolve any tension in your eyes. And imagine that you could let the breath occupy the space that your eyes occupy. As though your eyes are just all spaced now, and any constriction is let go. So what's left is a kind of stillness and just the capacity to see without seeing anything in particular. Can you also bring a dissolving breath and awareness to the space that your ears occupy. Both ears and all the space between them. And you rest in the space that your tongue occupies and as you breathe, relax into your tongue, the roof of your mouth, the floor of your mouth, your jaws, the base of the skull, everything at that level. Letting the breath penetrate and relax all constriction there. And then last, can you rest in the space that your brain occupies under the dome of your skull? The space that your brain occupies, your eyes occupy, your ears, your tongue, base of your skull, all of it the space in your torso, all of it. Now, feel into the space in back of you, in front of you, to the sides, above you, even into the earth. Can you just be in the space that's outside you? And be in the space that's inside you? And be the space that is inside you? And be the space that's outside you? and rest in it as continuous space.
So there's movement in your breath, and yet stillness underneath all movement. And silence underneath all sound. So as that space, Latsu says, by never being an end in himself, by never being an end in herself, she endlessly becomes herself. When you want to end a meditation like this, simply take a breath that fills your whole body out to your fingertips, toes, and top of your head, and exhale back into your belly, and then inhale into your whole body, and exhale. You can open your eyes. Thank you for that. It doesn't have um, me have a lot of words right available. <laughs> Good. <laughs> yeah, it's just a lot of space. Um, thank you. Thank you. I, I feel us uh, kind of coming to the home stretch, and I'm, I'm just so grateful for this time together and for just that sense you bring of the what's possible in our evolving. And so I want to invite any final words you might have, because we're all, all of us have all those emotions that are seeking to belong, seeking that unity. Um, yeah, any final words you'd like to share? Yes, I, I thought about final words, and there is a little piece I wrote about uh, God and the serpent uh, talking to each other after Adam and Eve got expelled from the Garden of Eden. And they're sort of, uh, the cherubim and seraphim are striking the set, and their God and the serpent are having a little talk. <laughs> and uh, so I wanted to read this little part. Uh, God says, uh, if they, meaning Adam and Eve, knew if all they ever knew was oneness with me, they couldn't appreciate the profound joy of it. They need to experience separation for comparison. The path to oneness is like lovers reuniting after a quarrel. And then the serpent makes a couple of jokes. <laughs> and then he said, uh, and the serpent says, and what's the reason for death? And God says, there is no focus without a deadline Old age, sickness, pain make you ponder the purpose of life. And the serpent says, and what is the purpose of life? And God says, to realize you have never spent a moment outside the garden. So here we are. <laughs> Thank you, my friend. Uh, for all who are listening, will you post also the uh, the Serpent Dialogue on your website? Yeah. Okay. So we will have uh, Stephen's website uh, available to you and posted so that you can find out more about his uh, executive coaching and meditations and all the resources that are on that website. Um, Thank you all friends for listening. And again, beloved Stephen, what a pleasure. What Thank a you. Delight.